Solution paper number four. Understand multidimensional. Sunday, August 21st, 2011. HTTP. Slash Westpinner.com. One, moving into a multidimensional reality. Multidimensionality is to know something outside the present moment. The Pleiadians, the good old philosophers, Plato, Socrates, and all the rest throughout our history made the rest of humanity take a leap forward in understanding our reality. Because they were thinking outside the box, they were in certain terms multidimensional. The reason they didn't find out even more than they did was because they thought too much. They never totally let go of their logical mind. Logic is there to understand third density, and that's when you have use for it. Just as logic often doesn't help you much when interpret your wildest dreams, it doesn't help you much in a multidimensional reality reality because they are often one and the same. This new age ahead of us, the age of Aquarius, is the age of multi-D. The self will be able to move in consciousness between many different realities, and the self will be able to build it and disappear. It will be able to move into fourth density consciousness, being the perceiver, not the thinker. It's the age when the unconscious mind comes up to surface and the logical mind has dived deep into the unconscious and the twine meet and understand each other. In the new age, the logical mind will no longer be in charge of the body, but become the advisor, and the unconscious mind, the mind that knows, which will no longer be disconnected from the rest of the bio mind, will become the CEO of the body. Female energy Energy became heavily suppressed during the Anunnaki era with a strong polarity towards the male. This created a huge imbalance in the human psyche, and we have suffered from this imbalance ever since. The male energy is logic and the female energy is emotion. Finally, in this new age, the two shall interact openly and there will be a marriage of consciousness. The two will become one. Therefore, it's important for men to bring forth their female sides and not suppress them, and for women to do the opposite, until a balance is achieved. This doesn't mean that men should be like women and women be like men, but we need to acknowledge the fact that we have both energies within. I very much enjoy to be with females, because I like the energy, and it brings out the female emotional energy in myself. How do we know that we are getting multidimensional? First of all, we already are multi-D, but have forgotten how to access realities outside 3D. So the correct question would be, how do we recall being multi-D? It is different for different people. For most it comes very subtly, while for others it hits like a rock. In the latter case, you could sit in a room and all of a sudden you find yourself sitting in another room, and you have no idea how you got there. Impossible? Not at all. The subquantum physicist, Dr. Borden of Life Physics Group California, LPGC, has a female friend who can disappear before his eyes in the middle of a conversation and then come back. Even he find that kind of creepy, but he is not surprised, because it can be explained with advanced life physics. 1. For most people, on the other hand, it will be more subtle. Here are a few random examples. You may be sitting in a waiting room, or a room you haven't been in before or very often, and you see something in that room which will trigger something inside of you. All of a sudden you find yourself being somewhere else inside your mind, in another time and place, and it's very real. You will get clear images of a simultaneous identity of yours, existing at the same time you do. When you wake up you may be slightly confused, but the feeling is empowering and you want to do it again. You will be able to connect with other aspects of yourself who are non-physical, seemingly living in space on other planets, in another dimension or density, and you will start realizing that these entities are all you as well, all living simultaneously. You will find yourself in communication with your spirit guides, or your higher self, whom will guide you and help you achieve your purposes and goals. You may call this your oversoul, although there are many oversouls in the hierarchy of the multiverse. All of a sudden you may find yourself thinking deeply about your ancestors. It may be your dead mother, father, brother, sister, or even dear friends and family members who are now on the other side. This is a sign that they are trying to communicate with you and the portal is opening between the physical and non-physical realms. Embrace such connections, because the people on the other side who meant something to you are eager to assist you from where they are now. It's very possible to communicate with them telepathically. I would encourage you to do so. Speaking of telepathy, this will be the language of the future, and part of being multidimensional. Have you ever had this experience where you think about something out of the blue and the person you're talking to is saying the almost exact words a few seconds later? If so, you just experienced a moment of multi-D. This will become more and more common. Or have you caught yourself thinking about somebody and a second later the phone rings and the person is on the phone? You were not expecting the person to call at that moment. Still, we are already being able to communicate telepathically. We do it all the time, but we don't recognize it. We read each other's thoughts, but have a tendency to either think the thoughts are our own, or we are puzzled as of where they come from. In fact, they are often somebody else's thoughts, more so than ever before. I am meeting people who, myself included, see certain numbers repeat themselves in their lives. It could be 111, 1111, 1212. 444, 711, 911, 333, or a random number, such as 35 repeating itself ever so often. This is another sign that the multiverse is communicating to you. It's your higher self getting your attention and at the same time showing you that you are aware and awake and ready to move on to what is next. Your higher self is looking for a two-way communication. When this happens, say out loud, or inside yourself. Hello, who are you? Please show me what you want. I am willing to learn. 1.1 Body Mind Spirit. What exactly are they? We are all living several lifetimes simultaneously. Some are on this planet and some are off-worldly. Although they are all different personalities, and even look totally different, they are all you. These beings may be humanoid, reptilians, insectoids, and whatnot. In a huge mix, you may live lives in all those shapes and forms simultaneously, unaware of each other. All this is perfectly normal and a part of being multidimensional. For the sake of keeping it simple, let's stay on this planet for a while. To understand multi-D, we first need to understand the basic of soul-spirit-mind-body. 
this is probably one of the most confusing subjects for mankind. It's gone so far that the words have almost lost their meaning. So let's see if we can get back to basics. Body. This is the vehicle we use in the lower densities to connect with the multiverse. It's the key to connect. And without it we couldn't. We connect by our DNA, which is currently evolving and redeveloping after have been tampered with. Approximately 250,000 plus years ago, when our DNA is not activated, we are using our body for basic things, such as transportation, eating, working, sleeping, having sex, other pleasure, communication, etc. When the DNA starts its 12 helices reactivation process, we are finding out that the body is divine, has endless capabilities, and is our most precious tool for evolving in this multiverse at this point in time. The body has the memories of the history of the universe within it, the mind. Simply speaking, the mind is mainly composed of two things, uh, the genetic mind, and two, the spirit mind. The genetic mind is the memories of the bloodline. You inherit your parents' memories on a cellular level, and those of your grandparents, great-grandparents, and your ancestors along the lines of time. These memories are accessible to the soul. The spirit mind is that of the spirit. When you die, you carry with you all the memories and experiences from your lifetime, and all those memories you were using from the genetic mind along the lines of time. Memories you pulled up to serve you in your lifetime to help you grow. You were probably not aware of that you were doing this. When a genetic memory comes up to serve you, you just use it like it was the most natural thing in the world, which it is, and you're not even aware of that you're doing it. The spirit mind is the accumulated experiences from all lifetimes you have had, on this planet and on others. Because all lives are simultaneous, all information is already there. Although all these beings walking around on the planet are still experiencing their thing, this is something our 3D minds have a hard time wrapping our heads around intellectually, because if there is only one big present, and all knowledge is already gained, how come we are still struggling with finding out things? It's because the now is constantly changing. Now is now. No. Now is now. No, it's not. Now is now. Everything is always a now in the multiverse. On a subquantum level we are in connection with all that is, which in this example means every living entity, animal and plant etc. in the whole multiverse. Fortunately, at this point in our development, most of these memories are inaccessible to us, or we would go insane from being overwhelmed. And it so happened that linear time was invented as a new experience. We created a past, a present, and a future to have random and more spontaneous experiences so that the prime creator could learn more about itself. This is the big experience, and the off-world beings monitoring our world are very excited right now when all these experiences in form of timelines come together. It is like taking an enormous number of experiences, separated from each other, and gather them all together and then sharing them with the multiverse and prime creator as one big experience. This is what is happening now. When you die and go to sitter space, or the between lives area, black, you review your previous life to see if you achieved your goals or not. There you realize what the difference is between genetic and spirit mind, because they both follow you after death as memories and experience. All the experiences you had go into a pool, or the memory of the soul spirit, same thing, and add to the overall experience of you, the spirit, or the oversoul. After have stayed in the blah for some time, time is experienced differently there, not the same as on earth, and decided what you need to learn for your next experience. You incarnate again on earth into linear time. You decide carefully which bloodline you want to incarnate into to be able to have an experience as close to what you're intending, and you bring some of your previous genetic and soul memories with you to support you to reach your goals. The rest stays with the soul in the afterlife, if it's not necessary for your growth in the next lifetime, but is still accessible throughout that lifetime if you open up a communicating with the soul. Who carries all the experiences you've ever had throughout all lifetimes, on earth or elsewhere? The reason we don't bring all over soul memories with us is because it would be too overwhelming in 3D, and it would distract us from experience what we have intended to learn within a certain lifetime. Hence, our memories are limited while on earth. The personality. The personality is not you. It's not your soul spirit. Your certain personality is something you have for one lifetime only. It's the combination of the soul fragment you used to incarnate into a particular lifetime and that of the genetic mind. So it's a combination of the spirit mind and the genetic mind. It's more based on genetics than it is on the soul. Though, if you want to experience a lifetime as a successful warrior, you make sure you get born into a bloodline which somewhere along the lines of linear time, on the genetic side, had successful warriors in it, or otherwise can support your growth in that direction. And you make sure the astrological aspects are correct when you get born. You may perhaps want to be born in the sign of Aries, which is a warrior sign. More about this later. Your mother and your father are usually of your soul group and there to support you, and they incarnate before you, from a linear time perspective, simultaneously from a multidimensional perspective, and know intuitively when to get pregnant and what to name you. Names have meanings. The spirit mind, or the soul fragment, see diagram 1A below, is there to support the genetic mind and forms the personality together with it. In another lifetime, you feel you want to be a healer to counter your warrior lifetimes, so you choose the appropriate genetic line for that purpose. Make sure the astrological aspects are correct, and incarnate. Your personality in that lifetime will be entirely different from that of your warrior self. The Oversoul. The Oversoul is the real you on a higher level. It's the accumulation of all your experiences into one big database. The Oversoul has its own Oversoul, which is the sun. Every human being on this planet has its own Oversoul, which is then connected to the Earth, which is the Oversoul for the whole humanity. The sun, after that, is the Oversoul for the whole solar system. In the raw material, HTTP, colon slash slash, lawphone.info, Oversouls are called Logos. The Oversoul is truly multidimensional in all the senses of the word. The Earth is a host, a living being, a child of the sun, whose purpose is to host life that is seated onto it. The ancients knew all this and hence worship the earth and the sun although we shouldn't worship anything. The humility our ancients felt expressed itself in worship. What we could do instead is to communicate with the sun, because she knows who you are, and will communicate back.
the sun, all the experiences from this solar system, has its own oversoul, which is the central sun that she is orbiting, which is the pole star, Sirius, while others actually say it's Arcturus, and our galactic oversoul is the central sun in the galactic center, then it continues with galaxies orbiting other galaxies, with their own oversouls etc, in an ascending order, this way, all information and all memories are forever stored for the prime creator to absorb, it's a vast concept, so when you die and go through the tunnel towards the light, you are basically returning to yourself, the oversoul, that's where you recover between lives, it's the negative space, by some called antimatter, the soul fragment, when you incarnate into a bloodline, you, the oversoul, is sending out a soul fragment, or a part of itself, to have the experience. Think of the oversoul as a huge baseball and the soul fragment as a ping pong ball. Then imagine this ping pong ball being connected with the basketball through a long stick. Then picture thousands and thousands of ping pong balls being attached to the basketball, and you get a simplistic picture of this process. See diagram 1A. After body death, the soul fragment returns to the oversoul to report in. The soul fragment, which is in charge of the body throughout the lifetime and oversees the progress, and which is what many call the soul, attaching to a baby before birth. Then from a third density awareness and a linear time thinking, is ready to experience another lifetime on Earth. Each soul fragment, together with the spirit mind and the genetic mind, make the full experience. It appears that over a lifetime, we move forward in time, equivalent to how many years we live, but the experience and the memories are stored in what could be perceived as vertical time. See diagram 1B. Linear time is just a movement in space and time, while vertical time is where the full experience and the memories are gathered and sucked up by, or connected with, the oversoul, and then with its own oversoul and so on. In an ever-expanding multiverse, we are creating the multiverse as we go along. We expand it through experience. Diagram 1A. Oversoul and soul fragments. Click on image to enlarge. Diagram 1B. Horizontal versus vertical time. Click to enlarge. Multidimensionality is befuddling to the consciousness mind of today. We are not like our ancestors, who were used to thinking multidimensional. We are so costumed to thinking linear that multidimensional thinking has become very foreign to us. Here is a multidimensional concept that a little kid I believe would have much easier to grasp than a linear trained adult. Let's say that one of the pyramids were built 25,000 BC however. It could also have been built 100,000 BC. The same pyramid just appeared simultaneously in both times. What I am saying is that many of the mysterious structures we see the remnants of around the planet were not always built in one time. These structures are multidimensional. And another thing to realize is that if the structures are big or huge, in our terms, they were not built by little people, so to speak. These structures were built in simultaneous time and then inserted into our linear time through vertical time. See diagram 1C. Diagram IC. Simultaneous time. Click on image to enlarge. Try to get your linear thinking around this. It's quite hard. Still, things like this happens, and we are not supposed to get our heads wrapped around it. We won't understand how this works until we let the conscious mind mingle with the unconscious mind, which is multidimensional, and let the two work together. Another typical example is the dream state. Four cycles sec or less. The realm of the unconscious mind. When you dream, anything is possible. One moment you are walking down the road with your friends, and now you're dreaming, and all of a sudden you are in the jungle, chasing butterflies. Next thing you know you're in deep space with your mother. In dream state this is normal and you don't think twice about it. It was just a dream. Now, have you ever been in a dream, suddenly thinking, oh, I'm just dreaming, and then perhaps even been able to change a few things in the dream? If you have, you experienced a moment of multi-D, when the conscious mind meets the subconscious mind. To change things in dream state is something we all can practice. If we are able to do this on quite a regular basis, we have developed a shortcut to becoming multi-D. We have a tendency to, when we wake up from a dream, think that oh, that was just a dream and now I'm awake. However, the dream state is just as real as when we are awake. It's just that when we are considering ourselves awake we focus on this reality and agree that this is what is real. I am not saying that we should all go to bed and dream and never wake up again, but what I am saying is that we need to first go visit the unconscious mind and dream state and say hello, and maybe participate in the dream. Take that experience up to this reality and then invite the unconscious mind to come visit us for a change. When it does, we will notice that anything in this reality becomes possible all of a sudden. We can change things around and travel wherever we want in the multiverse like it was nothing. Albeit, it will take a while before we are all able to do this. And to be fair, we need some more of our DNA reactivated first, but we would gain a lot from starting to practice already now, even if we are not going to be able to do it consciously in this reality quite yet, but we will experience tidbits of it now and then if we are receptive. This will be commonplace in the near future for those who choose to live on the new earth. This is a great challenge. We have been so costumed to think in linear time, that if someone comes in and says things could actually be in a different way, the conscious mind says, no, that's not possible, prove it, and then it shuts down, instead of thinking, ah, this is a new concept for me, and it doesn't make sense from the way I have learned to view reality, but what about it I have an open mind about it? Perhaps, if it's true, the answers will come to me. There are two key words here, open mind, that means opening the closed doors in the different departments of the mind and let what's in there come out and mingle with the little tiny conscious mind. In comparison, the little tiny bit of mind that we hear on earth used to be able to survive and continue building our 3D reality. The conscious mind is such a small fragment of the whole mind put together that it can be compared to the ping pong ball in comparison with the basketball. If we let the minds incrementally blend more together, we have something we can compare with the mind's oversoul. The mind becomes one and we are able to use our whole brain capacity to create in the multiverse. Unfortunately, and this is not real to people in general, those who are highly educated and have gone through the universe 
university and are highly trained, are more often than not the ones who are the most closed-minded. They are so overtrained in thinking linear and that this reality is all there is, that it is often next to impossible to even have a conversation about these things with people in that category. But as always, there are exceptions. Take our children as examples. When they are babies and after a few months start to develop their personality, they are immediately trained by their parents to think linear. They are programmed at an early age to shut down their unconscious mind and only use the conscious mind to navigate. This is something we need to change. Little children are very psychic and quite multidimensional. They can easily feel the energies of a person and start crying if the person who wants to hold him her is in a bad mood that day, or has something else going on inside themselves at that moment that frightens the baby because it's foreign to him her. In November 2010, I became a grandfather. While I worked on wrapping my head around that, I thought, weird, I'm not that old. But when I had come to terms with it, the little baby and I immediately found each other on a spiritual level. I adore him, and he loves me and always gives me this big sunshine smile as soon as he sees me, and wants me to pick him up. Knowing what I know about multidimensionality and different realities, I decided that when I am babysitting, I am going to do my best to preserve a multidimensional thinking in this baby, and I'm going to start early. We bought him a toy he could sit in, which looks like a carousel, and the baby sits in the middle and can rotate the whole thing in front of him. The revolving part is packed with different creatures. Some are making sounds, others jump up and down when he plays with them. So I decided that this is a spaceship and the baby is the captain. I also have a little ball which sparkles in all different colors when you bounce it on the floor. I activate the ball and put it in a cavity somewhere on the spaceship. This is the magic crystal, the key which makes the spaceship fly. I explain this to him, although he consciously doesn't understand it yet. But then we'll fly together to other stars and planets, and I explain what is happening. And he is in charge. He absolutely loves it, and on an unconscious level, he knows what we're doing. Another time we were at a restaurant and the baby picked up a straw and started investigating it. Curiously, I asked if I could borrow it, and when I did, I told him it's a magic wand and started blowing air on him. First we acted surprised and a little confused. I continued explaining that this was a magic wand and continued blowing softly on him. He started laughing and became very interested in the straw. He finally figured it out and we had a lot of fun with that. Things like this I believe are very healthy for our little kids, because instead of putting them in a rigid structure of thinking, telling them that there is only one reality, and that is the one we can see, hear, smell, taste and feel with your body, we can show them that there are many different realities, and they already know this. Let's keep that part alive in them. Please don't let them be like us. We are around 7 billion people on the planet today, and all these people are moving energy. We are metaphorically moving out of our old house and into a new, which is very different from the one we left. Humanity, as a collective, is moving energy towards a new paradigm. Not everyone is willing to move, but that was not their purpose anyway. We are all where we should be at each and every moment, and nothing is random in that sense. Different people need to learn different things. Yes, we are going to see people lose their houses, lose their spouses. The divorce statistics will soar when couples grow out of each other. Many will get sick and die, while others will go insane and perhaps even commit suicide. Many traumatic things will happen to people within the next few years, and it's already happening. But even if it looks unfair and horrible, remember that the people it happens to are just where they are supposed to be. On a higher level, they learn something big. This doesn't mean we should shut down our feeling centers and not care. We will feel compassion and sadness, maybe even anger and hopelessness, and it's perfectly normal. I just want you to remember to look at this from a higher perspective, and hopefully it will give you some comfort when bad things seem to happen to good people. In the process of becoming multidimensional, and with everything that goes with it on a physical and metaphysical level, we need to be prepared, stay in the present, be grounded, and become like a stable rock in the middle of a raging river of energy. Be aware of what you think, because now when time is passing by in the blink of an eye your thoughts will be very important, because they will form your reality more easily than ever before. So if you find that things are not working in your favor, recognize what it is you are thinking and projecting, because within this lies the answer. Change your thinking so that it aligns with your purposes and take necessary actions to reach your goals. If you become a stable rock in this raging river, from that position you can do anything. Figure 1. If you become a stable rock in this raging river, from that position you can do anything. Don't let the bad news from the outside world get to you. Realize that these events that you see or hear about are someone else's experience. It's not yours. Acknowledge that it is happening out there, in other local universes. Give some good energy in that direction if you wish, and then continue concentrating on your own growth. This is not service to self, but your greatest contribution to humanity. Your own growth is what is making a difference in the world, because every little spark of light in the darkness will quickly multiply and bring a new dawn for humanity. This is how you can contribute. This is how we all can win. 2. Messages and Mass Agreements in Dreamland I want to spend a little more time on the waking state, beta state, and the dream state. Theta state. The waking state is the conscious mind, which is 13-30 cycles sec, while dream state is the unconscious mind living out, 4 cycles sec or less. So when you go from the waking state to the dream state, you brain wave cycles slow down. When you wake up and are ready to go, you brain wave cycles are much faster. Dreams, like we discussed earlier, is a vista into multidimensional reality. If you think of any dreams you've had, that's a taste of how multidimensional reality works. Only difference is that in multi-D you are not helpless, like you often are in dreams. As a multidimensional being you are in charge of your reality and can change it accordingly. You will find that reality is fluid, just like in the theta and delta states, and much easier to maneuver. Dreams are not based on linear time at all. As you may have noticed, you move comfortably between realities and different presents. It may look like you're in some kind of linear sequence when you dream. You are walking down the street, going into a store, etc. But other realities peek in. There are suddenly lions running down the street. A caveman from ancient times walks through the store and eats the food and so on. Many dreams happen at once, and this is an important thing to understand. Spiritual components can come into a dream, 
Dreams can overlap and overlay each other. In Theta State you are the closest to spirit guides, who can come in the form of humans, animals, aliens, or basically any shape and form. They can also come in the form of dead relatives and friends. Have you ever dreamed about your dead parent, or grandparent? When my maternal grandmother died, I was 18 years old, and I was at home while she was at the hospital. I woke up, gasping for air at the same moment she died. I sat up in my bed, catching my breath, knowing instantly she was dead. The time matched perfectly, I found out later. In other words, my grandmother told me in dream state that she had just exited. I kept dreaming about her a few times after that, and from had been my grandma. She now had become my ancestral spirit guide. Your main spirit guides are often another, more evolved version of you, but soul fragments of your ancestors, friends, and relatives can also enter the basketball. See diagram 1A above, to give you guidance and to observe what you as a soul fragment is experiencing and how you progress. All of these beings can work with you to test your spiritual savvy and dream state. Pleiadian Lecture, December 4th to 5th, 2010. Bursts of Acceleration, CD number 1, track 9. These teachings are significantly different than the teachings from your spirit guides in the waking world. The trick is to be in charge of your theta state as much as possible. Just like in beta state, when you go into the bathroom and turn on the shower, you are not standing there, wondering if the water is going to come down through the shower head every time you jump into the shower. You take it for granted, and there are no worries around it. You normally don't lie in bed, thinking that now I'm getting up to take a shower. I wonder if the water will come on when I turn the knob. You can train yourself to do the same in dream state. Before you fall asleep at night, you say to yourself, Tonight I intend to resolve the following in dream state, and when I wake up in the morning I will have the perfect solution. Or, I intend to participate in my dreams tonight. I will know I'm dreaming and intend to be able to steer the dreams wherever I want and be in charge of the outcome. Make sure you think these thoughts with clear, pure intention, and don't let fear or doubt cloud your decisions. If they do, it cancels everything, and you won't be able to accomplish much, or anything, of what you sought out to do. Throughout this series of papers we have talked about service to self versus service to others, and I have intended to clear up some confusion on this subject. Because I know the confusion is there, we have talked about that each one of us is on our own personal path, and we all have our own learning curve. No God, spirit guide, or universe minds how long a person takes to learn. It's up to them. We need to understand that everything a person does, it's a contribution and should be honored in its own, specific way. If someone goes out and kills people in the street, that wouldn't be something I would support in any shape and form, but in its own way, even an evil act like that has a meaning and includes a learning lesson, not only for the killer, who is on such a low awareness level that he she is still learning to be a human, but for the victims and their relatives and friends. It's a dark lesson, indeed, but still a lesson that was needed in that particular time. No matter how traumatic, it's never random. There are no coincidences in an incident as I just described. Someone broke into your car? Same thing. There's a learning lesson both for the burglar and for you. Let's say you have a friend who has been a relative to a victim of such a horrendous crime as a shooting, and you really want to help her. You can of course sit and comfort her and listen to what she needs to get off her chest, which is an excellent way of being service to others, and you can even give some advice if called for. But the best help you can be is to heal the situation in dream state. Again, you follow the same guidelines as I mentioned two paragraphs above. You just rephrase your intention. Tonight, in dream state, I intend to help. Name, to heal from the trauma of the recent traumatic incident she was subjected to, and I intend her to absorb my healing energies and dissolve the imprint of this traumatic incident so that she can find a way to fully recover from it. Then you repeat this phrase every night until you notice your friend is getting better. It's a very powerful way of helping other, or yourself, to heal. So the key here is to trust your own abilities to resolve things in dream state and then go to sleep in a quiet room, comfortable, safe, and warm. Sometimes, you will be waking up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, or just to almost immediately go back to sleep again. This happens especially when you are doing deep work in your sleep. Look for fragments of the dream, and perhaps write down not more than 3-5 words and then go back to sleep. Your inner guide is telling you that something is being worked on. This is why you are waking up. Generally, when you're working on things like this, you're not always going to remember your dreams. But what will happen is that the different layers of your mind will become more integrated and aware of each other. And this is part of becoming multidimensional. We all have to be patient and trust that this will happen incrementally. Keep yourself fluid. And this goes both for your thinking and for your body. Make sure you're not dehydrated. Drink a lot of fluids which are not dehydrating you, so that your body has a sufficient amount of water. Alcohol, tea and coffee will dehydrate you in big quantities. Studies show that it's alarmingly common for Americans in particular to be dehydrated. Hydrated. So think about these things, and the transition will be easier and faster. It's in Theta State where mass agreements are made. It is here we agree, or disagree, to mass events that are happening. Mass events are here defined as events happening to the masses, not to one, or a few people. The unconscious mind is a very powerful part of the mind, the most powerful of it all. This is also the part of your mind you are entering when you are in deep meditation. Here is where you test things out and can vote yes or no to a certain reality, or mass event. As we become more multi-D, we notice that the unconscious mind is growing even more in power. I notice during the day, in my waking state, how the unconscious mind is entering a state more and more often, and the two integrate. It's not that it is making me sleepy, but I automatically get into a meditated state, which not only calm my mind and body down, but also make me connect to other realities while I do my normal job, and without negatively interfering with my performance. It's a very desirable state to be in, and I have learned to understand the fluidity of realities firsthand. Are you starting to understand why it's so important to slow down your pace in this fast-paced environment that we live in today? Moving quickly, never stopping, constantly multitasking is inhibiting us from connecting with the slower vibrations of the theta state and keep us distant.
disconnected from your unconscious mind and the multiverse, the powers that be, who are creating this fast-paced environment have a great knowledge into these things, so consider taking my advice that when things are speeding up, you need to slow down, I think I dare say that everybody has experienced a merge of beta state in the unconscious minds, it occurs when you are just about to fall asleep and you start dreaming while you are still in the awakening world, the two blend together, and it's hard to know which is real and which is not, more accurately put, they are both real, none is more real than the other, and if you think about it, it's not that hard to grasp, if you are between waking state and dreamland and for a few moments can't tell which is which, how can you be sure which one is more real than the other? You can't, because they are both just as real, or unreal, however you want to picture it. As a matter of fact, you first create realities in dreaming, and then you transfer them to the physical world, without being aware of that this is what is happening. So, in other words, it's the inner world that is building the outer experience. Play with it, have fun with it, until you can fully integrate and access the different levels of your mind at will. This is the goal and won't happen overnight, pun intended, but the more we practice, the better at it we will be. 3. Spirit Guides. Let's talk a little bit more about this too, because I know people are interested in this subject, and it is an important one. There is a tremendous amount of help and support for us on the other side, and this needs to be acknowledged. We need to put things into motion and be more aware of what is going on in the non-physical realm. This, too, is part of being multi-D. Despite if the black is controlled by negative forces or not, it's a rest place for us, and for most people a very pleasant one. And we need to remember this so no fear is connected with the afterlife. We all have guides, and many of us work with them. However, the guides give us advice, and then we don't listen to them. In certain terms, this is a good thing, because there are so many entities out there in the non-physical who are trying to play tricks with us. We want to make sure we are in communication with the correct supporting entities, or our higher self, the oversoul or deceased friends and relatives from our soul group. The important message here is to hold our own space and not become puppets to some invisible entity who is controlling your life and your decisions. Here is where sovereignty comes into the picture. If someone from the astral is telling you to do something out of the blue, don't just go ahead and do it because you have guidance. Guidance can be both supportive and destructive, and if we can't distinguish between the two, we are in trouble. Our spirit guides are often future versions of ourselves, who have more experience and knowledge than we do in our current incarnation. First of all, we need to address our true spirit guides with the following message. If you are to advise me or help me, I want this assistance to be in my absolute best interest, with the intention to let me exactly to where I need be. And if I follow your advice, it's because the intention behind it is to support my growth in the best way possible. I am not available for any other kind of interference with my life and my sovereignty as a spiritual being in a mind body. This is telling the non-physicals exactly what you are available for or not. No one can interfere without your agreement, but some are very slick and will attempt to get your agreement without your realizing it. So, once you've called up your guides and start working with them, you can also test them. And moreover, you don't have to follow what they say. Always remember that you are in charge, and the guides are there to support you if you call for assistance. Now, let's say they gave you good advice and you didn't follow it, and later you recognize this is the case. Then, tell the guides they did give you good advice. You noticed it and didn't follow it. Thank them for it. Show gratitude. Then, the next time, let's see what happens. And the next time, do these guides often seem to give you good advice? If so, maybe they are actually working in your favor, and their advice can be taken seriously. But don't be afraid to test them. They know what's out there, and they appreciate that you're not gullible enough to fall for any entities who might say they are your guides, but will lead you astray. I will add here, too, that even when you are connecting with guides who have your best interests in mind, they are not always giving you good advice. They are not perfect either, nor are they all-knowing. In other words, Words. You need to be in charge and make the decisions you may believe are in your best interest when you feel they are right in spite of advice you get. Sometimes, when you go against the suggestions from the guides, you will find you were correct, other times not. Another way to check the validity of whom you are in contact with is to use your body as a detector. You make an agreement with your body to give a signal one way or the other. Tell your body to respond in a certain way if the energies coming your way are not in your favor, and respond in a different way if they are. With time, it's up to us to develop such a fine-tuned intuition that we become our own guides. When a situation is at hand, we want to learn how to intuitively know how to handle it and when there's a fork in the road, we will know which way to go. The guides are only important as long as we need them. Once we don't, they will be happy to see that now we are adults and can make our own decisions based on intuition. They will be proud. However, don't rush this process, and don't feel you're less because you need spirit guides. It'll take time before any of us can stand on our feet well enough to be able to do totally without them. For most people, the step right now is not to manage without them, but to make contact with them. If you only knew how many helpful guides are out there, doing their best to catch our attention, and we don't respond, because we either don't believe in them, or have no attention on them. So, everything has its time. How do you call them up? Then, you simply say, Hello, spirit guides, I want advice, but only from those of you who have my best interest in mind. They will respond, and it's up to you to recognize it and start working with them. Ask them for signs that they are there. The trick here is repetition. By repeating our wishes, we will manifest what we want. With some training, you can become so fluidly connected to non-physical energy that your nervous system reaches outside of your body and is part of something much larger and the nerves carry the information in the non-physical into physical and you feel the truth of what you've been guided to do. Pleiadian Lecture, August 13th to 14th, 2010. Awakening to the Sun. CD number 1. Track
like for humanity at this time is like a feast of energy. We are like huge magnets to both good non-physical entities and not so good beings. They all come now and invite themselves to the party. Many are benevolent and willing to help us in ways they can without inflicting on our free will, while others just see a feast of energy and want to absorb it all. We can call them non-physical vampires. Two, you find this kind amongst the living too, and such people are always possessed. However, when you have reached a point where you have discarded your limited thinking and have raged above the crowd in consciousness, you will automatically attract beings who are there to guide you up to higher awareness. Recognize them, because they are there and would love to be noticed. Still, as a heads up, remember Star Wars. The movies? They talked about the Force. It could be used for good and bad. It was right on. These dark forces are of course out there, too. As we raise above those frequencies, we may not ever be so fearly affected by them, but a rise in consciousness do attract them, too. Instead of coming for us, they can't feed off our fear, because we don't have it anymore. They come for the societies of Earth and they infiltrate them. This is why the ET agenda is so incredibly complicated. There is very little chance that any human can gather enough intelligence on these beings to get a full picture of what's going on. There are beings we have never, ever heard of whom are infiltrating some government somewhere. The Anunnaki, Greys, and some reptilians are the main infiltrators, fighting over dominance. But there are a whole lot of others who are playing out different kinds of imperatives. It's too complex. Unfortunately, we don't need to know it all. It's enough that we know who the key players are, and their imperatives. I am doing intelligence gathering on these and will post later in the Exopolitics papers. We are not here to fight ETs, or to take sides. We are here to raise our consciousness. If it's unclear to you how you can raise your consciousness above the frequency fence we're stuck in, picture yourself floating in the higher levels of the atmosphere, looking down at Earth. You are there alone, or with others who are of the same frequency, and you see all the turmoil deep down there. Dark forces fighting each other, bombs going off, raging energies clashing into each other, government officials being bribed and manipulated, raging terror, cloning, people rioting. That's a good picture of how it works. Your body is still on Earth, physically speaking, but metaphysically you are not part of the drama. It's unfolding before your eyes, somewhere else. You can watch it play out, but you don't have to. You can go on with your business on this higher frequency while the struggle is happening, seemingly elsewhere, in a higher sense. It doesn't, of course. Everything is there simultaneously in the same space, but if you vibrate differently than those involved in the drama, you are not going to be part of it. Picture yourself in a movie, on a battlefield. Everything is chaos, death and terror, and the noise is extremely loud when bombs are going off, machine guns, hand grenades exploding. Then all of a sudden all this noise is fading and disappearing into the background and finally everything gets quiet. You are still there, but the experience of the war that was raging is dissolving. Then, everything is peaceful. The war moved elsewhere and you're no longer participating. It's not even in your reality anymore. This is how we create our new Earth. Some of the readers may already to some degree experience this. The dramas here on Earth have become something undetached from your psyche. Something that happens over there, but you no longer feel connected to any of it. It's like it's happening in another world. If so, congratulations. You are on your way helping to create our new future, our new Earth. 4. More on time and how it is used by physical and non-physical beings. The end of a cycle and the start of a new. Time is such a fascinating subject, because we can do so much with it once we've figured out how to use it and because over it, extraterrestrials use time all the time. For travel, time travel, make themselves invisible, play, due to time being different depending on where your point of view is, and which laws you are applying. ETs can use it in many, many different ways, albeit time is simultaneous, to be able to play the game. S. We need to use it one way or another. 4.1 time and frequency, Earth splitting in consciousness into mainly two different planets. People have been asking me every now and then where we go once we leave Earth? How many times do we reincarnate on this planet before we go somewhere else? Well, from a multidimensional perspective you can never leave Earth. LPGC is telling us in their working model that you are only indexed to Earth once and can never come back after body death. Because if you tried, you simply couldn't. Because it would be, in very simplistic terms, like making duplicate comments in a blog comment section. The software normally tells you it's a duplicate and doesn't allow you to post the second entry. The working model says further that there is no frequency fence holding humanity back here on Earth. But on the other hand it says that here on Earth we can only evolve so much. And then we have to move on to somewhere else to expand our consciousness, wherever in space and time our consciousness takes us when we're done here. From their perspective, I think they are correct. But I would like to add to this from a metaphysical level. There is overwhelming evidence that we live lots of simultaneous lives on Earth. And the answer to the question in the beginning of this section would be that on one level we can never leave Earth. Because all time is now, in a constant present. So a part of us will always be here. Also, there are as many different versions of Earth as there are people on it. And every decision a person makes creates a new, potential reality. Then, on another level, we are also somewhere in someone else. On other planets all over the cosmos and perhaps in other universes as well. Developing ourselves simultaneously. Time is fluid and slippery. Just like everything else in the multiverse. And we beings who live in it. Humans or non-humans, live under laws that were decided by the prime creator and the founders, whom have the power and knowledge to create whole universes. Different laws apply in different universes, and sometimes even in different galaxies. So, the next question I run into sometimes is that if all time is simultaneous, and a body dies and the soul fragment returns to the astral planes of negative space, why then does this soul fragment plan for its next visit to Earth? Like Dr. Michael Newton's 7000 plus case study show, if time is simultaneous, a soul fragment shouldn't reincarnate. We have slightly touched on this subject earlier, but let's expand a little bit on it. First of all, in the third density things are not set in stone. There is both predetermined events and free will in people's lives. Free will to change any planned, predestined, event. Like we mentioned about, Earth exists in many different versions and in many different densities and dimensions. It's not just one Earth, as we are trained to believe. The way our DNA is constructed by the original creator gods, with its basic 12 strands. 3. We ascend to a new density of Earth once we have had our helices reactivated. In 
other words, when the Anunnaki came and tampered with us, about 250,000 years ago, we descended to a lower density of Earth than the one we were living in at the moment due to that 10 of our 12 helices were deactivated. So let's start this discussion from a reasonable beginning. The Oversoul is your higher self, who knows much more than the part of you who is incarnated on Earth. This Oversoul has higher Oversouls, which it is connected to, namely the Earth, in some aspects, and the Sun, whom are in their turn connected to the central Sun in a local system, and eventually you are connected to the Galactic Oversoul, which is the central Sun in the Galactic Center and so on. In an ascending order, the Sun, as a Logos, a living entity and creator God in herself, is splitting herself to have an experience and sends those parts of herself out in cosmos to start orbiting around her. They become planetary bodies. Each planet has its own cycles and goals, which were determined before it was created. Creator gods, higher evolved beings, travel to new star solar systems and transform them, seed them, and life begins. They create the symbiosis necessary for life to function in first, second, and third densities. Four, they create the DNA applicable for the specific planet these beings are going to evolve on. For example Earth, souls are here to see to that the goals of a certain solar system are accomplished. Souls come here in huge quantities, and they are all unique, until we all again become one with the prime creator. These souls are what we normally call over souls today in metaphysics. So, let's concentrate on Earth for a while. The is how I've come to understand this concept. The Oversoul is splitting itself into a soul fragment. See diagram 2. This soul fragment is still you, a higher self within the bigger Oversoul. This soul fragment is then split into a certain amount of additional smaller souls, who are inserted on Earth to occupy bodies. Each of these smaller souls is incarnating into a body in a particular time, in the linear time structure, but inserted vertically, vertical time, simultaneously. Thus, you have different fractions of yourself incarnated into different time periods, but they are all you, the smaller soul, whom you consider being you. Reading this, was incarnated in this particular time, and one reason you can't perceive your other simultaneous incarnations is because you are separated by the illusion of linear time, a mass agreement, and an experiment that was planned out for Earth a long time ago. Diagram 2. Smaller soul leaving a body in present time to incarnate in the past. Click to enlarge. Let's say that you die today. The smaller soul, whom you consider as being you, leaves the body and returns to the main soul fragment within the oversoul. This soul fragment is separated from other soul fragments even within the oversoul for the reason to have a planetary experience. For example Earth, other soul fragments have experiences elsewhere in the universe, and keep those experiences separated. The oversoul then gathers all these experiences from near and far into one big database, which is then sent further to its oversoul and so forth. No information, and no memories, are ever lost. Once you are in the astral, your oversoul, you have access to the experiences you have had as all these smaller souls whom were incarnated on Earth, because Earth is based on linear time. The small soul thinks in terms of present and past incarnations, although, in actuality, they happen simultaneously. So you, who just died in our example, ponder if you achieve the goals you set before incarnation or not. You also have help from spirit guides and the council of elders to figure these things out. When you've decided what your goals are for the next lifetime, you choose the best astrological aspects and a bloodline which will enhance your goals, and then you reincarnate in what you perceive being the future. Diagram 3. Simultaneous incarnations. Split soul fragments in the above pictures is equivalent to small souls in the text. Click to enlarge. In reality, the oversoul, and above it, other oversouls, creator gods etc., have decided the goals for the planet. Each density cycle is 26,556 years. 5. A great year, which is equivalent to the solar system orbiting the galactic center once, and the oversoul, after had split itself into an Earth soul fragment, sent out in a known number of many fractions, small souls, to Earth like explained above. However, in a free will universe, these incarnations are not set in stone. Therefore, similar laws apply in the Earth astral planes as on Earth. The linear time concept is still alive and well, although time is not passing by at the same speed as on Earth. For some, time doesn't seem to exist. Although the linear time concept is kept within the realm of the soul fragment, the lesser you, lesser only in the sense that your knowledge and wisdom is less than that of the oversoul. Now, we would think that the next lifetime would be in the future, and many times that's the case, but is not necessarily true at all times. Perhaps a person in astral realizes she just experienced something very powerful in the previous lifetime, and someone, another self, in her perceived past has just been waiting for that experience to happen in the future, unknowingly so, but on a certain level of experience that could be true. So this person in the astral decides to incarnate in the past to live out the experience there. The past is fluid and all time concurrent, so it is possible to jump between past, present, and future and change things around from the astral into the physical. We can think of each lifetime as a time container, including all the experiences we had during that lifetime, and we can go back into that container and change things around. Diagram 2. Most common is to make these changes by reincarnating again into the past, but changes in your past and future can be done while you're incarnated by making certain choices. When you heal along the lines of time, you do the main work in the physical, in the lifetime you perceive as your present one, together with your best friend, your body. However, from a linear perspective, time is moving forward while our planet is in orbit around the galactic center on its way to complete a great year. So when the great year is complete, what you have in your time containers is what counts, and that will determine your soul body mind vibration. We need to look at this as a game, or it won't be comprehensive. So, in 3D we can see the interaction between linear and nonlinear time, and it transfers to the astral plane. Souls who are living out their 3D experiment won't go to the same place in the astral as those fragments of yourself who are simultaneously experiences higher densities. This is the complexity of the multiverse, before you die. Now, for example, decide where you want to go after you depart from this lifetime. The afterlife, just as life on the earth plane, is fluid, and in larger terms adjusting to your belief systems, be clear on where you want to go, what you want to do, what you want to experience, and whom in particular you want to meet on the other side. 
Dr. Michael Newton's research has shown that souls in the astral can with quite ease manifest their thoughts and thus create places to live without having to hire a carpenter. They build a house in no time with their thoughts. Everything is much less dense there and besides from that, the main difference between here and there is that you don't have a physical body. You have an astral body that you use, but it's transparent and can't do what physical bodies on earth can do. They can't hug others physically, albeit, they can energetically, and can't have sex like we do. To name a couple of things, the restrictions from not having a body is what drives many souls to incarnate again after have enjoyed afterlife for a while. So, a soul fragment perceives itself reincarnating into future or past incarnations to freely experience its own personal development. The spots, or vertical inserts of small souls into linear time, now fill their positions by experiencing events in a linear time fashion. With the past, present, and future, you have 26,556 years to figure it out. All civilizations will come to this point where they misuse energy, start experimenting with what they've learned from the gods, other creator gods. They use and misuse technology and are on the brink of destroying their own planet. Many races before us, here on Earth and elsewhere in the universe, have destroyed our own home planet before they were able to pull themselves together and get it straight. The question is, Will this version of Earth go the same way? At the end of the density cycle, time is always speeding up. This is what the Pleiadians call the nanosecond, 1987 to 2012. The star systems, in our case our own solar system, are aligning with the galactic center, and a lot of energy is released on the gamma ray spectrum. Those who have prepared themselves for this moment are very excited about what is happening, and they are like sponges. Their nervous systems adjust to the enormous amount of cosmic radiation, which is different from the dangerous radiation from nuclear reactors. Their chakras open up and the DNA is reactivating. In our case, as we were descending instead of ascending and had to go through this density several times with little hope to evolve enough to be harvested, now have a great chance to break that pattern. The reason, of course, why we had to stay here, was because we, on some level, allowed the Anunnaki and a few other races to tamper with our DNA. Like discussed earlier, we, who are the sponges, are now quickly having our DNA reactivated. With help from the original creator gods, the gamma rays, and our own willingness to evolve and ascend, we become multidimensional as we heal along the lines of time and at the very end of a great year, times collapses and timelines merge. When this happens, the question is, how much work have you put into your own expansion of consciousness? Depending on how much you manage to accomplish during the last great year, you can determine where you are at this particular point in time. Here's a simple checklist, the way I see it. Do you feel you've had enough of power and control, overuse and misuse of technology, secrecy, inhumane actions against each other, wars, famine, punishment, injustice, oppressive banking systems? The list goes on. Do you feel that you are expanding yourself, your knowledge, that you are wiser today than you were six months ago, or even weeks ago? Are you able to love your enemy, meaning those who are of darkness? Can you see that they are here for a bigger purpose, to help the rest of us with our ascension process by being our catalysts? Can you see that darkness is just another expression of yourself? Or are you still feeling hate, rage, or bitterness when you think about these forces who are controlling mankind in this density? Can you love everybody and everything unconditionally? Do you feel you are spreading light into the darkness in your local universe, your environment just by being you? Are people often coming to you for advice, and are just want to be in your space for no obvious reason? Do you mostly attract people of higher frequency? Are you understanding that there will be a split in consciousness on this planet and that it will split into two main different worlds, eventually, and branch out from there into multiple realities? Do you understand that the best thing you can do to help humanity on a personal basis is to evolve yourself and work on your own progress? This way you are like a candle in the dark, and this light, little by little, is lightening up other candles, as other people get triggered by your beingness and begin their own spiritual journey. This will branch out and eventually dissolve the darkness. Do you understand that by sacrificing yourself by not working on your own development and instead going and work on solving other people's problem is counterproductive and may slow them down, rather than speed them up with it will your own evolvement? Instead, giving them help to self-help is the absolute best way to go, because this way you are not interfering with the law of free will and the person's own experiences they need to have to raise their consciousness. Do you understand that your path is your path and everybody else has their lessons to learn, and they may differ significantly from yours? Are you grasping the concept that there is no right or wrong way to do things, just different ways? Mistakes are good to make, because that's how we learn. Intelligence is measured by how many times you are making the same mistakes, not so much if you make them or not. Do you understand that the intellect is limited in the process of raising your consciousness? Intuition and inner knowledge is senior to the intellect, because the former has lower vibration than the latter. Do you know that by judging others you judge yourself? We are all one, and what happens to one person happens to us all. The things you don't like in another person are the same things you don't like with yourself. These ten points on the checklist are indicators, nothing more, nothing less. It may be that you feel you are okay on all ten items, but not an expert. Sometimes you have a tendency to fall back on old trends. This is okay and normal. I can't emphasize this enough. We are humans, in third density, and we can only go so far here with all mixed energies around us. But my point with this checklist is for you to see if these, or similar things, are what you're working on, improving on, and putting most of your attention on. Or not, if you are, you are ready to move on. There will be a time, within the next few years, some time after 2012, when you feel the urge to move out from the big cities, perhaps move to, or build your own community which will be self-sufficient. You may team up with those of similar vibration and create a reality of your own. You will reconnect with nature and the elements and feel connected 
connected to them on a very intimate level. You will feel the awareness in everything around you. The consciousness in rocks, plants, animals, trees, stars, everything. Your nervous system will reach out through cosmos and beyond and you will become multi-D. There are quite a few people who are already doing this. Those who don't work on these 10 points on the checklist may choose to live in metropolitans. A life with sophisticated technology, cloning, microchipping, artificial intelligence, life extension via nanotechnology. But at the same time firm birth control is being implemented, where you are taken care of by a controlling government, which is perhaps even openly run by ETs. Read the Anunnaki. Most people in this category will probably not even read these papers, but we all need to be careful not to fall for the manipulation out there. It's not like we all of a sudden, from one day to another, will have all this ultra technology around us. It's creeping up on us, and if we're not perceptive, we won't notice, and one day we realize that we've become part of something we don't like. Once we've gone that far, it may be hard to break out. Why so? Because it's within the nanosecond you can make your best progress to reactivate the DNA. After 2012, slowly but surely, the new Earth will arise, built on the consciousness from those who choose, by soul agreement, to build it. It's going to develop into a fourth density Earth, while the third density Earth will continue existing in a parallel reality. For a while, the two will coexist, but eventually and gradually they will split from each other due to frequency differences. Those who chose the first path will find themselves in a less dense world, where people are multidimensional and have their 12-strand DNA activated, now working themselves up towards the next density, most probably with additional DNA activation involved, which may be a new cycle of 26,556 years. In our terms, although the raw material says we spend more time in fourth density, from our linear perspective, than we do in 3D, those who live in the fourth density will not perceive time as linear so much anymore, though, but that's a subject for future papers. Once the fourth density cycle is completed, if you manage to increase your vibration to the point where you can ascend to a fifth density Earth, that's what will happen. If not, you will probably stay in fourth density for a while to learn the lessons of the frequency. This is also exactly what will happen with those people who choose to, or haven't expanded their consciousness enough, to ascend to the fourth density Earth. This is what the end times are about. It's about choices and raising our vibrations. Time will start all over and a new third density cycle of 26,556 years will begin for those who remain within the third density frequency with small souls continuing to incarnate in the 3D. This is not the first third density cycle of 26,556 years. Archaeologists have found remnants of humans and other creatures that are older than one year. That's a given. However, like emphasized in the raw material, HTTP, colon slash slash, lawfond.info, a harvest was not always possible at the end of a cycle, and sometimes only a few were harvested to a higher density, if any. 4.2 choice and victimhood. If I say there are no victims, only co-creation, this will trigger people to react. They see children starving, mind control children, people in the worst imaginable situations and like to think of them as victims. They can't see how on earth these people have chosen to get into that situation. Understandably so, because we feel compassion for each other, and we care. We want to help those in need, and we want to understand evil. I don't like the word victim at all, because it implies helplessness and total effect. It is in perfect order to intervene when we see somebody suffer, being beaten up, starve, or whatever the situation may be, a helpless child. I'd be the first to run to help. It's not about that, but on a higher level, it's co-creation. This whole 3D reality is one big experiment, as we've discussed, and the souls who bravely decided to take a deep breath and experience it, out of love for the prime creator, to help it experience itself on a new level, did so by choice. As the game became more complicated, each soul sometimes gets involved in great challenges that need to be dealt with in that, or in a future lifetime. What it is all about is to be able to experience this reality to its fullest and raise one's frequency above the third density and complete the game. We have a certain amount of incarnations and 26,556 years to do so. It's not a big deal if we don't, but then we need to start a new cycle in 3D until we master the game. Mastering the game doesn't mean we need to know everything there is to know in 3D, but we need to know enough to raise our frequency and embrace the merging of our timelines at the end of the cycle, which is now, due to amnesia. We forget the bigger picture of the game. We see someone suffer, and we don't understand why. Not until we grasp that there is a learning experience in everything that happens can we see that even when someone suffers there is something to learn. If we see a bad situation, we need to give it immediate attention and discharge the situation, whatever it might be, and whatever is needed. Then, if an opportunity arises, with our greater knowledge, we can educate the person on the situation until we come to a point where the person can help him herself, or get other appropriate assistance. All help needs to have is a goal to be helped to self-help. If we have that in mind, we don't directly intervene with that person's learning process. We only teach them how to take charge over a situation that got out of hand. Then, use dream state to work with that person's energies. It's still foreign to people, but it's in dream state agreements are made, so our decisions, physical reality, and problems can be solved after the souls in questions meet in theta state and do energy work. Go to bed at night with the intention to help a certain person in need. Whether you know the person well, or if it's someone you met for the first time, is irrelevant. You may not remember when you wake up, but if you have a clear intention before you fall asleep, this is what will happen. Do it a few nights in a row. It will be of great assistance. 5. Amnesia. Around 11-12, years ago, coinciding with the fall of Atlantis and the Great Flood, the Earth tipped on its axis. This is fairly well known, but not the consequences from it, and why this happened. If we count back, it was 3-4 Nibiru crossings ago. 12,000, 15,000, 3,600 equals 3 plus. 4. We know through Sitchin's translations, other sources, and direct encounters with the saw AMI, that Nibiru's gravitational pull caused these effects on Earth. The tipping of the axis is what created amnesia. Earth, whose axis had been much straighter and to now be in an angle totally changed our contact with the cosmos. How is this? You may ask. This has to do with how memories are stored. Mainstream science of today has no clue 
of how memories are stored. They just assume it's stored in the brain. Not so at all. In metaphysics, and even in subquantum physics, we know that memories are stored in the ether and not in the brain. The biological being, the biomind, has access to the collective memories of humankind through the ether. If the Earth is tipped on its axis, depending on how much so, it's getting more and more difficult to access the collective memories, until at a certain degree tip it's nearly impossible to do it at all. If it's really bad, it can create a blank slate, which would make time start all over again from zero, where people and animals on this planet would have no past memories. There have been a lot of pole shifts on Earth over the history of time, and the Earth's axis has tipped more than once. But there was a major incident happening 12-15,000 years ago. Since then, when a soul is entering a biokind on this planet, they go into amnesia, because the anglet which they would have to access the past memories makes it almost impossible to do so. In alternative research studies, conclusions are often made that it was simply a celestial outside body which caused both the biblical deluge and the tipping of the Earth axis. The biblical flood most certainly happened due to the passing of Nibiru three cycles ago. But how about the tipping? Could that be? Or is there a more sinister reason for our amnesia which was never told to the Sumerians or to people of other cultures? The current tilt of the Earth's axis is about 23.4 degrees. 6. We know there was also a misuse of energies, crystals, resources, and power involved at the time of the flood and the amnesia. Today we use oil, which is totally insane, when there is knowledge of how to get zero-point energy out of the air, but it has everything to do with whom is controlling the resources, of course, and where the money lies. The old gods, during the Atlantean era, were mining for yellow gold, and we humans are still mining for gold today, but now it's black. Both they and us have depleted Earth of its resources without having any respect for the planet which still hosts both these different beings today, humans and Anunnaki. But was misuse of energy by the gods actually the reason for the tipping of the axis? And if so, did someone want us to forget? The clue lies in my earlier papers, where we discuss how Marduk rewrote history to favor himself as the god. He wanted to erase all memories of earlier gods of this planet to avoid competition. To do this, he of course not only had to rewrite history, but also erase the memory of our earlier history and replace it with false memories. 7. Marduk was not a scientist, at least not at that time, and had to rely on others to accomplish certain science scientific equations and create different effects. The Guardian Alliance is telling us that it was the Pleiadian Samjay Sanunaki of Alcyone and their Enlilid Edekran and Marduk Nekromata Nibiran allies who were behind the house cleaning of Earth's historical records around 12. 500 years ago and are the ones who have run most of the World Dominion campaigns on Earth since 250,000 years back. 8. And interestingly enough, Joshua Free, author and Anunnaki hybrid, claiming to be Nabu, Marduk's son, in his current incarnation, mentions the Mardukite Necronomic and Anunnaki on his website. I would presume it's the same group the Guardian Alliance are talking about. 9. My best guess is that the Earth axis was tilted during the passing of Nibiru, when the deluge came, but perhaps the Enlil, Jehovah, and his people helped tipping it with assistance from their scientists to really wipe out the memories of Earth together with the human population and their hybrid offspring. Or it was done afterwards when the Enlil to his big disappointment discovered that a part of humankind had survived thanks to his half-brother Ea. The Enlil's intention was of course to wipe out the whole human Anunnaki hybrid population, but maybe he also wanted anyone who landed on Earth, or any new species created after the tilt, not to have access to the memories in the ether. The Anunnaki, of course, knew how memories are stored. Then, later on, Marduk simply had to rewrite the history from the flood up to the day he wanted it to be year one. Day one, 5.1 clarification of the human experiment and the dependency on linear time. Now it becomes clearer how, and from where, the human experiment originates. It basically started with the fall of Atlantis and the Great Flood. The Earth tilted on its axis and mass amnesia followed together with the wipeout of most of humanity. This happened around the middle of a great year, 26,556 years, and we are now living in the opposition of the time, on the other side of the galactic center. Before the Earth tilted, people were much more multidimensional and could tune into collective memories with much more ease, merge with the elements, and not being caught up in linear time and the frequency fence. Linear time was, as it seems, introduced by the Anunnaki, when they told humans about history, and how everything has a past, present, and an unknown future. Nothing wrong with telling us about history, you may think, and as a principle, you're right, but by telling history from a linear time perspective created a limitation which was pretty convenient for the gods. If people started thinking in this new, overall agreed upon fashion, they would be easier to control than if they were able to access all time simultaneously after that. Everything changed. Linear time became an even more solid concept through the industrialization era we still live in. Before that, time was more local. People knew when the sun rose, how it moved across the sky and set in the evening, and they built their day around that. After all, that was still a more multidimensional way of thinking and living. Later, with the industrialization, everybody had to be on time for work. Clocks popped up everywhere, and you were timed at what you were doing. Then, at a certain time, you got off work, etc. Linear time became very solid. Some say it really took off in the direction when the railroads were built. The railroad companies put out schedules when trains arrived and left, and people had to adjust to those. So the solid version of linear time didn't start until a few hundred years ago. There was a sole agreement to participate in the linear time experiment, although on a lower level it may look like pure suppression. But for those who have read my papers from the beginning up to this point know that everything in existence is prime creator expressing itself, albeit, Earth is not the only planet in 3D which operates on linear time. It's one of the most monitored, because it's also a living library. Souls, like ourselves, who are here in this reality, are controlled 
contributing tremendously to the overall learning process of the multiverse, and the excitement amongst DT races is big now as we approach the end of the nanosecond. 6. Timelines and the electromagnetic fields. In science, the electromagnetic spectrum is the yardstick they use to identify what their instruments are picking up in space. However, if scientists had different kinds of instruments, they would pick up something else. This is an example where thinking inside or outside the box becomes so important. Scientists build machines to be able to discover something out in space, and then when they start using them, they say, look, we were right, this is what we have discovered. Much so, because they were expecting to find it. The electromagnetic spectrum, just like time, is basically an idea. Time is real in the sense that we can see how the sun moves and the earth spins, and the electromagnetic spectrum has a reality and those frequencies of energies with electro and magnetic qualities appear to enliven the atmospheres of space and can be used to convey information. 10. When it comes to simultaneous lives, we experience life from a visible spectrum. This reality, which we experience, is just a tiny spectrum of the overall available range of spectra there are available. Our eyes are adjusted to only see this little tiny bit of reality. Animals, in that respect, are much more sensitive than we are and have a wider spectrum available to them. There is consciousness involved in the electromagnetic spectrum that the scientists are not aware of. Scientists tend to think that the electromagnetic spectra are lines on a yardstick, but the spectrum is everywhere. It's intertwined and not a line, like on a thermometer. If the thermometer shows 60 degrees, it doesn't mean it's 60 degrees where the thermometer is, but in the atmosphere. Get the picture? Within the visible spectrum where we live, there are simultaneously other containers of time, locked away for our protection. If they weren't, we would go insane. Schizophrenic people have tuned into these containers of time, and that's where the voices come in to tell them what to do. They are overwhelmed and give their power away to entities from different timelines. They let them decide for them. Also, if other selves would come into our lives constantly, we couldn't have one. Singular now. However, what we're missing here on Earth is the psychic perception of that these other timelines with other selves exist and an ability to tune into them at will. Here in our modern world, where reality is work, family, children, and sleep, we are much focused. What we see is what we get. Our ancestors are something in the past, dead and buried and that's it. In the Eastern philosophies, however, things are looked at differently. Same thing with most native tribes, here in America and elsewhere. They look at the ancestors as if they are still alive in the now, but in another spectrum of reality, they talk to them, ask for guidance and show them respect even if they are long dead. In our terms, they look at their relatives on the other side living simultaneously with them along the lines of time. They know they're there. Electromagnetism is pulse rates upon which energy vibrates. The problem starts when scientists try to measure those and put them on a spectrum scale, one upon the other. All they have done in reality is to find out that they exist, but they fluctuate and interact and don't exist one above the other, necessarily. It's more a dance of frequencies as the Pleiadians call them. Dance meaning that they interact with each other. Science names things and think it's real. They tell everybody it's real, and it becomes real. There are so many false ideas put out by scientists who find out something about something, put a label on it, makes it static, and non-flexible, and call it good. Then physics books are printed in millions to update with new information so the kids can learn that this is the new truth. Science hasn't realized that the universe is fluid. Dimensions are fluid and interact. The electromagnetic spectrum is fluid. Like Dr. Borden of LPGC put it, everything is fluid. What is true today may not be true tomorrow. But isn't that discouraging? Though, how on earth will we find the truth? The answer is that we won't. As long as we look for a static truth, we create our own truth. And truth seekers are, more often than not, looking for truth in a wrong way, and they will never find it. When we come to peace with that the multiverse is fluid and fluctuates and changes due to all our thoughts and emotions, then we have found the truth. Because it's that simple. Therefore, so long as we are separated, exploring souls in an ever-changing multiverse, we will need belief systems to hang on to. Without them, we are nothing but infinite awareness and infinite intelligent consciousness. We are one with the prime creator, so the trick is to find a belief system which serves us well and expand on it to have a more conscious experience. And on and on it goes. Everybody on this planet and beyond has belief systems they operate from. And on the downside, if our belief systems are very rigid and solid, we create a trap for ourselves. Because we become like the fish in a big river who accidentally swims into a pond at the side of the river and gets trapped. After a while he thinks the pond is all there is. We need to be fluid in our thinking and beliefs, and ready to change when it serves us. That's how we stay in tune with the multiverse and operate on the same terms as it does. This is again part of becoming multi-D. We need to let go of our rigid belief systems and open up to new ideas. Feel what is going on. Even those who say they have no extrasensory perceptions, s, have them all the time, but they don't pay attention to them. I have said many times in my papers that when time is speeding up, and the pace in our life is increasing due to more challenging work situations, or whatever the reasons may be, we need to slow down. It's so important, because if we don't, we can't learn how to tune into these parallel realities and interdimensional, simultaneous existences. What really happens when you raise your frequency is so often spoken of when comes to ascension and changing densities is that we are learning to tune into the different spectra of reality and become aware of what they do. We don't go from one spectrum to another. We tune into them all, simultaneously. Each of these spectra does something specific. The infrared from the sun is warming us up. The gamma rays give us information, etc. They are all there at the same time, in the same space, and we are tuning into them in conjunction with raising our vibrations. All spectra have affected us simultaneously, always, but we don't pay attention to what they do for us and our bio mind. When we understand this and learn how to receive, it is a part of reactivating our DNA and become cosmic beings. This gives a whole new perspective to the phrase, it's time to wake up. The bottom line when we talk about the electromagnetic spectrum, EMS, is that it is not mappable. A certain insect tunes into its perspective of EMS, while another type of insect tunes into another. All insects see things differently than humans, and even if humans agree to certain combinations of EMS, they individually see things a little bit differently from each other. We don't agree on everything, 
Although we may agree upon that a table is a table, and a photo is a photo, there are endless combinations of EMs, and we choose which combinations we want to tune into to create our reality and expand our senses. Similar thing applies when we say we move into a higher density. All densities and dimensions are fluid as well and don't exist one upon another. They exist in the same space, simultaneously. The trick is to tune into them, which can only happen when we expand our consciousness. When we come to a point of acceptance of the fluid multiverse and start opening up our chakras to experience it, we also open ourselves up to greater knowledge of how the multiverse works, and from that we raise our frequencies vibrations, and can tune into higher densities of existence, where things are more like in the dream state. It's fluid and easier to create what we want due to that reality is less dense solid. The electromagnetic spectrum is always responding to what is viewing it, and that's when we get to the quantum level. However, if a species is programmed to view things in a certain way, collectively, the end is able to glue itself enough to form itself into the mass agreement. Then, in its extension, when you are born into a certain time on a certain timeline, you are immediately tuning into the programming applicable to that particular time in reality. It's programmed into your body mind. What we are doing now is that we are breaking the programming by questioning the validity of the reality we have been accustomed to perceive when we're doing this one by one two by two and so on it's like a wave of consciousness sweeping over the planet which other humans tune into and start exploring until a certain percentage have broken the programming and started seeing things from a bigger perspective then more of humanity will eventually follow 6.1 consequences of earth's migrating magnetic poles here is something to think about every time we use nuclear weapons whether it is like with nagasaki and hiroshima or tests in the deserts or under the ocean it doesn't matter it creates a ripple effect in the space-time continuum and disturbs the electromagnetic field especially now when time is speeding up the ripple effect is even wider and faster. The same effect is created when nuclear reactors blow up, like in Japan just recently, 2011. Of course, it causes radiation, which will have devastating effect on the whole planet. Not just Japan, but it also creates a shocking effect in the space-time continuum. In the past, some 11,000 years ago, by the end of the Atlantic era, nuclear weapons were used as well, and could have been part of the reason the Earth axis tipped. However, pole shifts are also a cosmic phenomenon and part of a natural cycle, but nuclear energy used out of control may tilt the axis into an unusual angle. Now as we speak, the airports have started changing positions of the landing marks to fit the change of the electromagnetic fields on Earth and the polar regions. They are realigning themselves with the shifting of the North and South magnetic poles. People on the Internet have since long been discussing the consequences of migrating magnetic poles and pole shifts. Everything has been discussed from one end of the spectrum to the other. To use a metaphor based on a term we just discussed, no one really knows. And some doomsday people have written whole websites about how this will cause the end of mankind. As the magnetic poles are migrating, the Earth's electromagnetic field is weakening. A strong magnetic field is keeping things together, making reality solid and durable. When the field is strong, not much progress is happening on the planet in form of spiritual enlightenment. However, when the field weakens, things become less dense, and reality more fluid. Those who are ready and have prepared, sometimes not only in this lifetime, but through previous lives as well, are now opening up to the cosmos around them and start activating their dormant DNA. This is happening every time we have a pole migration of a pole shift, and there have always been those who have managed to fall through the crack of an otherwise solid population and ascended, mass ascension or harvest. However, hasn't happened in quite a few cycles due to the suppression of our DNA activation and the fact that our 12 helices were reduced to two, and we descended rather than ascended when interdimensional beings came here and interfered with our process on a higher density earth. In addition, the Anunnaki wanted to experience another level of control in the lower densities, where they could use physical bodies for their convenience. So it was a combination of all these things, and probably more that I am not aware of yet, that led up to what became the third density earth. So, pole changes don't only create bad effects on the population of a planet, it does create earth changes and weather changes of magnitude. And it's true that many people will die in the process, and lots of catastrophic things will happen, but still there are those who will gain from it, and those are the ones who have been prepared for this and can use it to develop themselves as biomines on earth. Again, like always, it has to do with our vibration and how we have learned to deal with your emotions and how well we can manage energy if we have overcome fear of death fear of the elements fear of the earth fear of the unknown fear of the body and fear in general not only will our survival potentials increase exponentially but it will be the best thing that has happened to us in this cycle of third density it will be the springboard to higher frequencies of existence if a hurricane is coming your way talk to it show it that you are aware of its consciousness acknowledge it and embrace its existence tell it that you know why it's there and feel its presence the storm will feel your presence as well and change direction figure two al gore and his global warming campaign the weakening of the magnetic field is as mentioned above part of the cosmic cycle the changes in the field are manifest from the sun whom is following unusual behavior having more bursts of electromagnetic energy, solar transmissions, etc. The sun herself is activated because she is picking up from other areas of space. 11. The sun being part of a light relay system in the cosmos. 12. When the cosmos is going through bigger changes, the sun is picking it up together with all the planets in the solar system. The global warming advocates, such as Al Gore, saying that global warming on Earth is happening due to pollution and has other man-made causes fail to tell us that all planets in the solar system are heating up. Not only Earth can hardly have that much to do with human interference, although I certainly support that we need to stop polluting and destroying our planet, albeit being unrelated to global warming. 
This is all a distraction to keep people's mind away from what is really happening, and the lies people like Al Gore are promoting is an attempt to distract us from raising our consciousness. When the magnetic field is weakened, more cosmic radiation can penetrate, and because light is information, the increased amount of light, in the gamma ray spectrum in particular, changes our perspective of reality as a bio mind. It changes the width of the visible spectrum, which results in that people start seeing things they haven't seen before. With this I don't just mean that people start seeing auras, ghosts and other supernatural things shown in the paranormal TV shows, but they also start seeing UFOs and ETs that are interdimensional. Some of them were there all the time, but people were not tuned into the frequency so that they could see or perceive them. Some of you may suddenly see beings appearing in and out of frequency in their home, as there is a bleed through between dimensions, and these beings are occupying the same space as you are, but on another frequency, meant as a joke, but still very true. When you are locking the door behind you, thinking you are finally on your own for a while, think again. Figure 3, UFO sighting in Arizona, 2008. This can be exciting for those who are already prepared to meet other realities, but quite scary for those who are not. Still, this is what we need to be prepared for, because in the future, when we're more multi-D in general, not only are we going to see and perceive other realities and timelines, but we will also be able to travel through space without using spaceships. We will be able to travel energetically with our light bodies, or avatars, and transfer our DNA from one place in the universe to another by using stargates and black holes, and even be able to travel in thought, notably in an advanced form of remote viewing, something that is already developed on this planet today and practiced by a few. The technology is already here. 13. I want to emphasize again that I am not anti-technology, and I don't think we should run into the bushes and leave everything we've learned about technology behind. Technology can be enhancing if used correctly and with a conscious mind. Once we've gained higher awareness from DNA activation, responsibility also comes with it. 7. Multidimensionality in summary. Becoming multidimensional is not some new age love and light wishful thinking. As the planet revolves around the sun, the sun revolves around the Milky Way galaxy, and on her way to complete a great year of 26,556 Earth years, we, the sun and the planets are going through different cycles of learning. And at the end of every great year, it ends one cycle of third density and a new third density cycle begins. For those who still, understandably so, have a hard time thinking in terms of simultaneous lives and multi-D. Let me give you another metaphor here. Figure 4, the forest multi-D metaphor. Imagine a forest. That forest is the soul of fragment. See diagrams 2 and 3 above. The forest is full of trees. All these trees are you, and they are shooting up from the ground, reaching for the sky. They all exist at the same time, but are separated from each other. Let's pretend that this separation is linear time here on Earth. However, in reality, we can all see that they exist simultaneously, inserted from vertical time. Metaphorically speaking, they just stand there having their own individual experiences. Still, the soil, or the ground, in which the trees are rooted are part of the tree as well. That's where it gets its energy and food and water which can make it grow and survive. The ground also connects the tree with the other trees in the forest. We can call this the soul level, or the subquantum level. Therefore, everything is connected. If the ground then is connected to the earth, we can compare this with all the separate parts of you. Each tree, small soul, is connected to the forest, soul fragment, in the whole earth, the oversoul. So you see that not only the trees in the forest, that are all having their own experiences, but also the ground and the soil are part of you. It's all connected. But the trees are where the soul fragment, the forest, has its focus. That's where the life energy springs out to have the greatest experience. The same time goes with living different lives simultaneously. You flush energy to certain trees, by a minds, throughout time and that's where you focus your experience. Then you can add it if Earth is the oversoul in our analogy. There are more forests on Earth, and these forests are other planets where you exist as well. I hope this helps the reader to grasp the concept. Figure 5. Indian Elders. One thing people of this generation have forgotten is how important it is to listen to our elders, just like the native Indians did and still do. Not only are the elders wiser in the sense that they have more experience in this life because they have lived longer, but they also can open up a part of your timeline which you haven't experienced. Due to that you were not there. All in all, you were, because we are everywhere in the multiverse at the same time. But like in the metaphor about the forest above, we have our focus in certain times, on certain timelines. The elders, with their stories, can be of great help for you to understand more about yourself and the reality around you. What they tell you create images in your head that connect dormant experiences in yourself with what the elders tell you. It can also be interesting to hear what they have to say, because they make you put you perceived present time in perspective with the time in the past that was experienced firsthand by somebody. It's like having a person from the 1500s coming and tell you about their lives. It's going to open up things. At the end of each great year, time is collapsing and timelines from the last great year merge together. There will either be a pole shift or a great tilt to the planet's axis, which will weaken the magnetic field and make us more psychic and receptive to the cosmic gamma rays from the sun and the galactic center. And this will activate our dormant DNA, junk DNA, and we will slowly become multidimensional after linear time has collapsed. Our chakra system is not limited to our bodies, and the crown chakra is not the top chakra. There are seven chakras in the body and five outside the body, which correspond with the cosmos around us and make us connect with everything that's in it. I am told there are more than 12 chakras, but for now, 12 is the number we are working on, because this was the number our creator gods once upon a time used in regards to our biology. There are many challenges and distractions on our way to becoming multi-D, and it's hard work to break the programming we have been subjected to, but as we bravely plow through the barriers, it will become easier and easier. Keep your chakras open and work on your karma. Make sure to take care of unfinished business and get out of debt. The latter is very important. 
Learn more about what is going on, but remember that the best information you can get doesn't come from the internet, but the internet, which is your inner network, your inner knowledge. All the answers you need can be found inside yourself, but to be able to find them, you need to reconnect with nature, and if you live a busy life in a big city, move out of there if possible, and if it's not possible at the moment, make sure you get time in nature, where you can sit and meditate, look around, connect with everything around you, and communicate with the elements, discuss things with the trees, the stones, the sun, the stars, that will connect you to your inner self, 